Good evening, everyone. I'm Rebecca Price. I'm a program coordinator here in the Special Collections Division, which is right upstairs on the second floor and home to two of Nashville's beloved community spaces, the Civil Rights Room and the Votes for Women's Room. I want to welcome everyone to Nashville Public Library for this evening's inaugural program for the new series, Then and Now, The History of Nashville's Minority Communities, presented by Vanderbilt University. Nashville Public Library Special Collections is honored to host and co-present this new and exciting series. We are thankful to all of you here tonight and watching live on YouTube for joining us. Before we begin tonight's program, let us be reminded that we occupy the ancestral and traditional lands of the Cherokee, Shawnee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, and Creeks Nation. We would like to honor all the ancestral stewards of this land on which we meet today, from the elders who have gone before to the generations to come. Now before handing this evening over to Dr. Churchwell, please remember to validate your parking ticket if you parked in the library garage. The validation machine is located at the main circulation desk in the lobby. And please be mindful that we are recording this presentation. Now, without any further to do, I would like to welcome the vision behind this series, Vanderbilt's Dr. Andre Churchwell, one of the most titled men I've had the pleasure to work with, professor of biomedical engineering, professor of radiology and radiological sciences, professor of medicine, cardiology, Levi Watkins, Jr. MD Chair, Senior Advisor to the Chancellor on Inclusion and Community Outreach, and an all-around scholar and gentleman. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Rebecca. Thank everybody for attending. This is our first panel discussion on then and now the history of minority communities in Nashville. As she mentioned, I'm Andre Churchwell, Senior Advisor to the Chancellor on Inclusion and Community Outreach at Vanderbilt University. That's my role and title and function tonight. We're very much excited about bridging the gap between the city and the university, and a community outreach is a huge and important way to do that. And our presence in this lovely hall, in this building, is, is, a, is, a, is a real testimonial to that fact. As a native Nashvillian, or in current parlance, a unicorn, quote unquote, and someone who has spent a lot, where's the thing here, is that unicorn, who spent a large part of his academic career in the study and pursuit of diversity and inclusion in medical schools and in higher education in general, I felt with Vanderbilt growing, Nashville growing so rapidly, Vanderbilt too, that the stories of our minority populations, their histories, community challenges, and successes and in some cases in over a century, needed to be told and saved for posterity's sake. And also some who know those stories are aging and we need to save those stories and their stories. I'm thankful that our hosts and partner, the Nashville Public Library and their special collections team led by the wonderful Rebecca Price with a beautiful polka dot dress on tonight, also, <laughs> also sees the value of this endeavor. As you can see from our newsletter, there are six panel discussions to come this academic year. And with the continued growth of our immigrant communities, there will be more stories to tell. But this year we've scheduled tonight, part one black community story of Nashville with a focus on North Nashville and Pearl High, but with a preview of coming attractions, the history in South Nashville of Fort Negley and African Americans there. We'll have more to say about part, part two when we get to that next year, but we want to share a little bit of that nugget of information with you tonight. Of course, and if you follow the newsletter, September 13th, we have a Latinx, Hispanic community stories. November 1st, the Jewish community. December 6th, the LGBTQI plus community. February 7th, the Native American indigenous people community. And April 30th, our last event of the year will be our AAPI community. So everyone get these on your calendars. Before I introduce our panelists for tonight's discussion, I'd like to ask my chancellor, our chancellor, Daniel Diermeyer, Vanderbilt's ninth chance to offer some opening remarks. Chancellor Diermeyer. Well, thank you, Dr. Churchill, and uh, good evening, everyone. It's my great honor to join you here tonight, and on behalf 
of Vanderbilt University to welcome you all to the panel discussion on the history of Black Nashville. This is, as you just heard, this is the first um, in a series of conversations that we are proud to be hosting in collaboration with Nashville Public Library. Tonight and in the month ahead, we will gather here to learn together about the vital histories of Nashville's minority communities, their unique stories and their profound and transformative impact on the city, our nation, and greater society. I want to first express my deep gratitude to our outstanding panelists, not only for sharing their expertise, perspectives, and experiences, but also for your long-standing and ongoing commitment to preserving, exploring, and illuminating these critical aspects of our shared history. I also want to thank everyone at the library. For well over a century, the Nashville Public Library has served our community and transformed countless lives, in part through outstanding programs like we are witnessing tonight. Our city is growing and changing at a breathtaking place. This is a pivotal moment for our community, and what we must do is to chart a course to a bold new era of innovation and prosperity that will bring ever-increasing opportunities to all of our citizens. But as we pursue this bright future together, it is imperative and essential that we also look back, that we continue to explore, and that we forever remember and reflect upon the city's extraordinary past, from the turning tide of the Civil War to the rising tide of the civil rights movement. And it is imperative that we do so now, today, as yet another racially motivated killing tops the headlines, and as our hearts are heavy with grief and with the knowledge of all that remains to be done in order to truly achieve the just and peaceful world thought by those for whom many of the streets just outside of these doors are named. Vanderbilt is proud and honored to be part of this effort because the rigorous examination of the past and the complex social histories that continue to form our present is deeply embedded in our DNA as a research university. It is one of the responsibilities that institutions like ours have to society and is one that we do not take lightly. Indeed, from the beginning, our work has shaped Nashville just as Nashville has shaped Vanderbilt. This university is inseparable from the city it calls home. This year, we are celebrating our sesquicentennial. That's fancy Latin for a 150th anniversary the 150th anniversary of our founding. That's a long time to span, and Vanderbilt has evolved just as Nashville has evolved. And while we have much to be proud of, we know that our university has not always lived up to its purpose. Perhaps the most famous instance is that of Reverend James Lawson, who was expelled from Vanderbilt in 1960 for his role in the peaceful lunch counter sit-ins protesting segregation, but who, in keeping with his message of love and forgiveness, a message that he so often taught us, he later reconciled with the university and is now one of our most revered alumni. In the namesake of the Lawson Institute for the Research and Study of Nine Nonviolent Movements, at Vanderbilt University. Reverend Lawson's is a story that many of us in Nashville know well. But for every story we know well, there are many stories that remain untold, artifacts that remain unearthed, and heroes that remain largely unsung. These heroes include the lives of many 
will be discussed here tonight, such as the Black Union soldiers who fought in the Battle of Nashville, and the parents, teachers, and leaders who worked to establish Pearl High School. They also include black workers who physically built our city's key buildings and monuments, including enslaved people whose labor contributed to the construction of the state capital, and whose efforts must never be forgotten as Nashville grows. But discovering these important aspects of our history, analyzing them, sharing them, and exploring their meaning for today, that is the task of research, scholarship, and dialogue. And it is a task to which Vanderbilt is deeply committed. In 1873, that's our founding years, I know you can do the math very easily, 150 years, 1873. In the wake of the Civil War, our university was created expressively and with intent, and in the words of our founders, to contribute to strengthening the ties which should exist between all sections of our common country. This vision, the original founding vision of Vanderbilt, remains, and it is now more urgent than ever. And this public library is a great partner to help us achieve it. Ours is still a divided nation, and amid our stark differences, we are rapidly losing the ability to engage in productive civil discourse. But at Vanderbilt, part of education means exposing our students to the broadest range of ideas and perspectives possible and teaching them how to respectfully debate the issues that matter to them with people whose point of view might differ. That is why we're particularly proud to be collaborating with Nashville Public Library. In the effort to protect free expression and civil discourse, public libraries are invaluable allies. So, as we celebrate our 150th year and look toward our future as a university, as a city, and as a community, this partnership is a tremendous asset and will continue to yield untold benefits. I'm honored to be here tonight to express my gratitude to Nashville Public Library and to all of you joining us here tonight. I'm excited to learn from our panelists for the evening and throughout the remainder of this important series. It's an honor to be there, enjoy the rest of the evening, and with that, I will turn the program over to our speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor Diamar. So tonight's program is replete with those who have both studied and in some cases live the North Nashville Pearl High School story. They include historian Linda Wynn and her beautiful Pearl High Red, Pearl High class of 1966. I might add, though I don't have red on, there's a red dot in my tie, Linda, and my book cover is red and white. There you go. So I did pay attention a little bit. Linda is Assistant Director for State Programs for the Tennessee Historical Commission, and she'll start our program with the history of North Nashville. Following Linda, we will also hear from Angela Sutton, Research Assistant Professor of Communication and Science and Technology at Vanderbilt University, who is studying the Fort Negley Black History story and the soldier story. And it's fascinating, and she will share that with us as a preview of our upcoming panel next year on South Nashville, Black, South Black Nashville. Next, you'll hear from Pearl High archivist Mildred Saffel Smith, Pearl High class of 1964 in her beautiful purple, uh, Melvin Black, Pearl High School class of 1955, also a teacher at, at Pearl and in, in, in the Metropolitan School System. And then we'll close uh, with more Pearl High alumni, but specifically that legendary 1966 TSAA State Championship team down here on the end. Please stand when I call your name, Walt Fisher. Please stand. There you go, okay, I got you, I got you. Tony Mormon, there you go. 
Melvin Smith is not here. Is Melvin here? Nope. And uh, we got Joe, Joe Herbert. Tony, got you go. Joe's here. And we're, and we're missing Ted the Hound McLean, who, because he wasn't the star of the show, probably decided he needed to just hold out, <laughs> which is okay. We understand Hound, uh, and we keep those two seats reserved in their honor here, I might add. I want to add also we have a Pro High School Honorary Class alumnus here, Andrew Marinus. Andrew, raise your hand. Director of Special Projects at Vanderbilt University and author of Strong Inside, the Perry Wallace story and the collision of race and sports in the South. It's really important that Andrew is here to share that with us while he's given some opening remarks. And I'd like to include representing her brother tonight in the front row. If she would please stand, lights come up in the audience, Perry's sister, Jesse Wallace Jackson. Please, right? thank you for coming. Thank you. Many of you know Perry Wallace, definitely a Vanderbilt pioneer trailblazer who integrated the SEC schools. But before then, there was the legend of the TSAA championship Pearl High School team, and we will talk more about that later in our session. We have a standard template for these discussions, always starting with the history of the community in discussion, and, and we will then begin this with our historian, Linda Wynn, to share some comments about the history of North Nashville. Linda. Thank you, Dr. Churchwell, and I would like to take this opportunity to also thank you for having me to be a part of this program. Uh, I think it's extremely important that we go back and remember the history of North Nashville uh, and Pearl High School. When we think about Nashville and its founding, Nashville has been a center of African American uh, culture in the Upper South. African Americans, enslaved and free, made up 20% of Fort Nashville settlers in 1779. From these early years through the Civil War, a growing African American community in Nashville, led by a small group of black elites, quietly built the foundations of a future society <coughs> developing schools, churches, and businesses. The Civil War brought new freedoms and challenges as Nashville's African-American population increased. North Nashville spans Metro Center to the border of Bicentennial Mall and includes a rich history of early Nashville, covering the neighborhoods of Bardo, Buena Vista, Germantown, Hadley Park, Jefferson Street, Richland Park, Salem Town, and Scottsboro. Since before the Civil War, Nashville was a beacon for African Americans with Jefferson Street area serving as an anchor for the community since the mid-1800s through the 1960s. The mid-20th century building of the interstate highway system, public housing projects, and so-called urban renewal programs were commonly viewed as key elements in the modernization of America. As Zach Keith, formerly with the Tennessee State Library and Archives, reminds Nashvilleans, buildings of the interstate highway system, public housing projects, and so-called urban renewal programs for those who lost homes and businesses were more likely to be poor and African American. Such projects entailed a serious disruption or even destruction of their communities and made it more difficult to accumulate poverty, property and wealth. The effects of these projects persist today. Despite the progress achieved by the Civil Rights Movement in the mitigation of Jim Crow laws, which today are seemingly under attack, three federal acts and one state act negatively impacted North Nashville. They were the Housing Act of 1937, the Wagner-Steagall Act, and the Housing Act of 1949. 
1956, the Federal Highway Aid Act authorized the construction of a national interstate highway system to accommodate the increased levels of traffic associated with the post-war economic boom. In Tennessee, most urban planning routed the interstates through predominantly African-American neighborhoods. The urban communities established in the wake of the Civil War were often bulldozed out of existence or bisected by interstate construction. In 1945, the Tennessee General Assembly passed the Sum Clearance and Urban Redevelopment Act, authorizing housing authorities to condemn blighted areas and raise them in the name of urban renewal. However, the definition of blight was subjective and left to the local housing authorities' discretion. Housing authorities uprooted entire neighborhoods, failing to consider the role of place and landscape played into community identity. Furthermore, many housing projects increased segregation by concentrating and placing people along racial lines. Urban renewal happened all over Nashville. It happened on the slopes of the capital, where a poor neighborhood, red light district known as Hell's Half Acre, was cleared in the 1950s to make space for a six-lane road and commercial buildings. Black Bottom was another notable Negro neighborhood in downtown Nashville until the 1950s. The area was nicknamed Black Bottom because of periodic river floods that left muddy residue on the streets. Black Bottom included working and middle class families. In 1883, the city built Pearl School, first through eighth grades on Fifth Avenue North. Although some elite blacks complained that the school was too small and located in Black Bottom and on the border of Hell's Half Acre. Over 400 students graduated from Pearl when it was located in Black Bottom. Black Bottom and surrounding Negro areas were lively and culturally rich. Two blocks to the south of Black Bottom were professional black enterprises. Meharry Medical College on First Avenue, Mercy Hospital, Millie Hale Hospital, Herbert Hospital, and the famous Renaissance writer, Zora Neale Hurston, after moving to Nashville around 1912 to live with her brother John Houston, was a student and a 1915 graduate of Meharry College. The New Deal programs placed no investment in Black Bottom, but did finance relief projects in North Nashville. Pearl High School building, Andrew Jackson housing project, recreational facilities at Tennessee a &I State College. After World War II, however, Federal low-income housing projects were not built in Black Bottom, but sprung up in South, East, and North Nashville. Between 1948 and 1972, massive urban renewal projects forced historic black businesses and churches out of downtown Nashville, including the Bijou Theater and Playhouse. It was an African-American enterprise located on the west side of Fourth Avenue, midway between Gay Street and Charlotte Avenue, and was one of the first African-American theater chains in the South. From 1923 to 1925, Betsy Smith appeared there regularly, as did Ma Rainey in the 1930s. Count Basie performed on stage. And for close to 40 years, the Bijou Theater featured both live performances and film until it was raised in 1957 for the construction of the Nashville Municipal Auditorium. Soon, Black Bottom and Hell's Half Acre succumbed to the wrecking balls, bulldozers, new highways, 
broader avenues, redevelopment projects, and commercial zoning policies. Today, the only remaining building in what used to be the African American District in Nashville is the Morris Memorial Building that was designed by McKissick and McKissick for the Sunday School Publishing Board of the National Baptist Convention USA Incorporated. Dr. Caldwell, if you would go to slide three. Okay, do the next one and the next one. Many students, both former and present, graduated from or go to public schools in Nashville and Davidson County that are named for African Americans. However, many of these students may not have known or know for whom these schools were named. According to Debbie Arthur Cox, two years after the Civil War ended, the Civil City Council called upon the Board of Education to select locations and provide suitable buildings for the accommodation of colored scholastic population in Nashville and to bring colored children to the city under provisions of the existing city laws. African American schools that included uh, names such as Ashcraft, Bellevue, Carter, Hadley, Mary School, Mount Pisgah, People's School, and Trimble Bottom, to name a few. Uh, if some of you are like me, and if you were sitting around listening to your parents or your grandparents talk, you heard these names, but you had no idea what they meant or for whom they were named. On Monday, March 4th, 1833, the nation's seventh president, Tennessee's Andrew Jackson, was sworn in for his second term. On that same day, another Tennessean, Alfonso M. Summer, covertly opened a school for Nashville's African American children. It was a bold move. Uh, this was in the wake of the Nat Turner uprising two years earlier. Southern whites had began a particularly violent reign of terror against black efforts organizing institutions like schools and churches, which were central to the African American experience. When we look at schools, schools like Washington Junior High School was named for George E. Washington. He was a prominent African-American educator and a former principal of Pearl School. J.A. Galloway served as Washington's first principal. Additions to the school were made throughout the 1940s and 60s, and other principals of the school were Braxton R. Merle, Isaiah Hay Suggs, and Clarence Austin. Washington Junior High School was a feeder school for Pearl senior high school, as well as Fort Greene, they were demolished in the mid-1980s to make room for the new Pearl Cone School. You know, when we think of schools attended by African Americans, one school is very seldom, if ever, mentioned, and that is St. Vincent de Paul Catholic School. It was founded in 1932 by St. Catherine Drexel and her religious order, the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament. Located on 1704 Hyman Street, the school had a reputation in the African-American community as being a premier elementary school in the city to educate their children. Some of the top administrators at Nashville's HBCUs sent their children to St. Vincent. For example, Charles S. Johnson, the first African-American president of Fisk University, sent his son, Jeb Vincent Johnson, to St. Vincent. His son was a prominent architect and educator. And when he joined the ancestors, his son, Jeb Charles Johnson, the former US Secretary of Homeland Security, during President Obama's administration, 
brought his father back to Nashville where he was eulogized at St. Vincent de Paul Church and interred in historic Greenwood Cemetery. St. Vincent alums have made contributions in all fields of endeavors, from serving as presidents, deans, provosts, and professors at institutions of higher education, to serving as commissioners of departments in state government, primary and secondary education, and other fields of endeavors, including being a historian. <laughs> Other schools attended by elementary and junior high, or in today's vernacular, middle school children, included Fort Greene, which was built in 1940 and named for Ashcroft principal Ford N. Green, an African American. I'm not going to say very much more about Pearl High, since uh, Dr. Smith is going to speak about our alma mater. However, I will note that visitors noticed the community pride that made Pearl's achievement possible against the odds. Even W.E.B. Du Bois noted in his autobiography, he had never seen people of color with so much self-assurance. Let's go to slide five. Fisk University, the oldest, that back, 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 back. Sorry, sorry, There you go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Fisk University, Nashville's oldest institution of higher education, was established on January the 9th, 1866, to offer education as a means of building better lives to formerly enslaved African Americans. African Americans, both enslaved and free, exhibited a concern and desire for education during the antebellum and Civil War periods. Prior to 1856 in Nashville, these needs were met as blacks attended clandestine schools and also schools that were called subscription schools that were established for free blacks, though they were often attended by the enslaved. The racial fears preceding the Civil War produced a 1856 city ordinance prohibiting the education of all African Americans. The schools remained closed for more than a decade. During the Civil War, the Union Army emancipated enslaved Americans on the south, on its southward march. In February of 1862, General Clinton B. Fisk arrived with Union forces occupying Nashville and one of the many Union soldiers and chaplains who became committed to instructing the formerly enslaved uh, and beneficial influence in the African-American community. In 1865, the organiz organizers purchased a site on the fringe of downtown Nashville, and General Fisk used his influence to secure the former Union Army barracks to house the school. After World War I, enrollment of form, former servicemen and African-American cultural renaissance of the 1920s and 30s further infused the spirit of African-Americans, pride and independence into the student body. In 1947, Charles S. Johnson became the first African-American president of Fisk University. In 1955, a modern revolution unfolded in the nonviolent protest against racial segregation in Montgomery, Alabama. And five years later, college students throughout the South began to build upon this new civil rights foundation. The students trained in nonviolent protests staged their first student sit-in in November and December of 1959. If you think about North Carolina, is February the 1st, 1960. So hear what I'm saying. <laughs> the sit-in movement continued during 1960 and involved more than 100 cities 
across the South as the student movement ushered in a decade of activism. When we think about the sit-in movement and those students from Fisk University, Tennessee State University, or Tennessee State a and College, uh, American Baptist Theological Seminary, and Meharry Medical College, and the strength and tenacity that it took to sit on lunch counter stools knowing that you were going to be beaten and not retaliate is a testament to their character and the philosophy in which they believed and practiced. There's a difference in being a philosophical adherent and being one that is a tactical adherent. One, you really believe in what you're doing, tactical. I can do it for the minute that I'm sitting on the, on the stool, but it's not a philosophy by which I live. All of those students, regardless of what university you're talking about, played vital roles in the modern civil rights movement. You have Meharry that was established. Uh, when we think about Meharry and all the work that they have done and put in, in terms of health care, not only in Nashville, but across the world and indeed the United States of America. When I think about American Baptist College, which I consider the mecca for the civil rights movement, simply because there were so many students like John Lewis, James Bevel, Bernard Lafayette, C.T. Vivian, who studied under the Reverend Dr. Kelly Miller Smith. They were all at American Baptist College. They provided the leadership along with Diane Nash, and if you stop and think about the 1960s and a woman being elected to chair the Student Nonviolent uh, Committee here in Nashville, that was unheard of in 1960. Women are still struggling today to try to gain positions of leadership. <laughs> when we think about Meharry, my mind often goes back to John Henry Hale. And I think about John Henry Hill because there was a public housing facility in Nashville named John Henry Hill. When I was traversing Pearl High School, I had no idea who John Henry Hill was. And I'm sure most of the students there in my class from 63 to 66 did not know who John Henry Hill was either. John Henry Hale and Millie Hale were a wife, husband and wife team that established a hospital in Nashville. It was the Millie Hale Hospital. And that public housing facility was named for John Henry Hale. They gave up rooms in their house to have a 12-bed hospital to serve the needs of African Americans in Nashville. When I think about Andrew Jackson, which was in the vicinity of Pearl High School, it was named for uh, Andrew Jackson, president, <laughs> first president from Tennessee. But when you look at their programs, some of the social programs that took place at those institutions or those housing facilities, you, you get a feel for how students who came out 
had aspirations to move on to something bigger and better, simply because of the programs that were offered. That was a 500 uh, occupancy that was constructed on Shawa. One of the other things that, that, that comes about with this housing program, one of the largest public housing programs was built around College Hill. The architectural firm of McKissick and McKissick developed that particular area. And it catapulted Moses McKissick III into a position of leadership with housing in Washington, D.C. North Nashville is rich in its history. It's extremely rich. All we have to do is just take time and maybe just read a little bit about it. When we look at that, that, that civil rights movement and, and to think that people like the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King came here and said that the movement here was the best organized in the Southland. He said that on April the 20th. That was the day after the home of Z. Alexander Luby was bombed. Uh, I might add that there is research going on right now uh, looking into that particular bombing uh, because there's a, a lot of things that's kind of funny about what happened uh, on that day that is just now beginning to capture researchers' opinions. I want to end with saying that North Nashville was decimated by the construction of I-40. Okay? That impact was staggering. 626 homes were demolished. 128 businesses, primarily owned by African Americans, were wiped out. The loss represented about 80% of the black owned businesses in Nashville. Nashville cons council person who was a representative, became a representative in 1970, Harold Love Sr. said, once a thriving residential business and entertainment recreational facility left the community broken. The construction of I-40 forever changed the community by causing economic and social decline in neighborhoods, businesses, and cultural fabrics. Some determined residents with deep family roots in the community are trying to steer Jefferson Street to a future that revitalizes its blight while preserving its heritage. North Nashville and Jefferson Street, with a historical narrative of long-standing profitable prosperity, a flourishing music and entertainment scene, and an academic and intellectual achievement, connoted North Nashville as achieving success and prosperity through hard work, determination, and initiative. North Nashville and Jefferson Street are a laboratory for some of the most important historical, social, and cultural events in the southern United States. In closing, remember the words of Marcus Garvey, a people without the knowledge of their past history, origin, and culture is like a tree without roots. Thank you.
sorry about that. I can't okay. Sure. Sure. Thank you, sir. <laughs> wow. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. That was switch slide decks. Uh, Angela Sutton, research assistant professor of communication and science and technology at Vanderbilt, we share with you some of the research of Fort Negley and its connection to, black, to the black Nashville community. Angela. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Oh, wow. Um, I have never in my life had to follow Professor Wynn before. <laughs> I don't wish this upon anyone. <laughs> um, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna try to live up to um, that. I can't, but I'll try my best anyway. Thank you so much for allowing me to be part of this event. Um, I'm so excited to share some of the research that I've been doing with the descendant community at Fort Negley. Um, and let's get right into it. All right, so um, as most of all, I, I think, know, Fort Negley is right smack dab next to downtown in southeast Nashville, um, and it's part of a series of fortifications that was built during the Civil War in order to protect Nashville from a Confederate onslaught. Um, so picture the scene, right? We have 1862. The country has been in chaos for a while. It's been divided, and in the city of Nashville especially, it literally was brother against brother, right? Like, that, that's, that's a really a trite saying, but in Nashville it was true. There were many brothers who were on different sides of this conflict. Um, and when we get to Nashville, the Union Army tried to do a thing that had never been done before. And so, of course, if you want to do a thing that's never been done before, you reach out to the black community and you ask or coerce the black community to help. And so many, many enslaved and free black people came to Fort Negley, St. Cloud Hill, in order to build the biggest inland fortification of the war. Now, this community was incredibly diverse and everyone sort of was there for different reasons and came there through different means. So you have some people who voluntarily came to offer labor. We had a big population of free blacks who came. Um, who worked and wanted to work in exchange for fair pay. Not everybody got that. Uh, we also had enslaved populations who ran. They were refugees from the war, or they were using the war as an opportunity to get away, to self-emancipate, and to seek out a new life safely behind Union lines where slave catchers couldn't get them. So they came to Fort Negley as well. Then you have people who the Union military pulled out of their homes, pulled out of plantations, pulled out of other places of enslavement, um, or pulled out of their churches, as you can see in that picture at the top there, uh, and forced them to come to Fort Negley to build. So there's this really diverse population of people at Fort Negley who were asked to build, and they labored for a very long time in the hot sun, insufficient food, no sanitation, um, and over 800 died in order to make that happen. Uh, I wanted to mention the name of the youngest person who did this. His name was Moses McGavick. Like the pike, like the plantation, Moses McGavick. He was 12 years old when he was forced to build. Um, when the fort was built in 1862, it was a site. And I know when you go now, um, maybe it doesn't stand out against the landscape quite as much because we are a city of skyscrapers, we're rapidly growing. But back then, St. Cloud Hill was the tallest point in the city of Nashville. And this fort was made out of limestone. It was bright, blinding white. It was incredibly tall. It had a giant American flag sticking right out of it. And the soldiers would light fires all around it in their camps every night. So it was a place where refugees who were running from enslavement would follow the light. And it was also a place that really divided a lot of the people in Nashville because it was such a like impervious fortification. So a total of 4,933 people helped to build Fort Negley. Um, and we know this because we finally collected all of the lists that the military kept of each and every person who labored. Um, and we've collated those lists and put them into a database. Uh, because it's incredibly important that we know every single person who contributed to Nashville being so fortified that very shortly after the war ended, Nashville was simply impregnable because of Fort Negley and the sacrifices that people made. So skipping ahead to the Battle of Nashville. The Battle of Nashville was incredibly fascinating as well um, and interesting particularly to this cause because it was the Battle of the Civil War that had the largest African-American participation there were 13,000 black soldiers 
who were in the segregated regiments of the United States military, or we call them USCT, the US Color Troops. They fought at the Battle of Nashville at, in conflicts like Granbury's Lynette um, and in Peach Orchard Hill uh, and in the battlefields in order to protect the city. Uh, actually, um, Gary Burke, are you, can you raise your hand? Yeah, so Gary Burke here, he is a descendant of one of the soldiers who fought at Peach Orchard Hill. He is, yeah, raise your hand again, Gary. Wave it proudly. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, so his, his ancestor, um, great, great, great grandfather, Private Peter Bailey, um, he was stationed at Fort Negley during Reconstruction, but before that he fought in the Battle of Nashville um, in Company K uh, of the 17th Regiment. Yes, okay. Um, and Gary Burke was the first descendant of Fort Negley to, um, to approach me and talk about how to preserve these stories of this population. Um, so his video is up on the Fort Negley Descendants Project. If you all want to see, it's beautiful. It's really emotional. Um, and Mr. Burke does a wonderful job uh, explaining how he came to find out that he belongs to this population. In fact, he was putting on the Union Blues and Living History reenacting at Fort Negley before he even knew that his great-great-grandfather had done it as well. And he's not the only one, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and, and he isn't the only one. So many of the descendants of Fort Negley were called to the space before they knew that they had a connection to the space. So fast forward, after the war, um, think about that. We have 13,000 black soldiers who fought and we have almost 5,000 laborers who built this fort. So that's a total of like 18,000 people, plus another maybe 2,000, 3,000 ish who participated in other ways, like helped with the wartime infrastructure, helped work in the hospitals. A lot of African Americans labored in the hospitals as well, um, things like that. All of those people had nowhere to return after the war, right? Where are you gonna go? You're not gonna go back to the plantation. And so they stayed here in Nashville and they tried to build a life. Um, and many of them settled right at the foot of that hill. So where Fort Negley is, oh, can I go back one? Yeah, all right, so you see Fort Negley there. There's a science center behind it, which is super fun. You should take a look. Um, but right next to it, the, the circled in red, that is the Bass Street neighborhood. That neighborhood was founded by black Civil War veterans who fought in the Battle of Nashville. So they came right back to this fort because during Reconstruction, it was a space where people like Mr. Burke's ancestor kept the space safe while Nashville was trying to figure out how to survive in this post-war environment where white terror groups were trying to push down the accomplishments that the formerly enslaved had made, right? So I wanted to show you this picture because I think it really speaks to some of the things that Professor Wynn was saying about urban renewal. So in the 60s, of course, you know, the highway system comes through. Uh, it's not just North Nashville that's affected. It's all the black communities in South Nashville too, right? You got Cameron Trimble gets a highway right through it. You got the Bass Street neighborhood. It gets erased. All those homes become eminent domain. Um, we talked to some of the descendants who were living in the Bass Street community before it was raised. Um, and their video is also on the Fort Negley Descendants website, so if you all want to Google it, you can watch what they say. Um, but they tell us that they went voluntarily because they were told, hey, you know, your homes don't have electricity and water yet. In the 60s, can you believe it? It didn't have electricity and water in the 60s. And they were promised electricity and water if they would go, but they weren't all placed in the same place, so they had to lose the neighborhood that they had had for almost a century. This neighborhood was combined of people who became a family because they fought together in the war and they had to split apart because they had to leave their homes and urban renewal came through and what was once a thriving black neighborhood with a church, with a juke joint, with a walnut house becomes this highway structure next to Fort Negley Park. All right, so the next three slides, I'm gonna be really quick. I just wanna share with you some of the initiatives that I'm working on with the descendants, um, with the Friends of Fort Negley. Uh, we've got the president and I think a couple of members in the audience as well, which is really nice, I'm glad to see you. Uh, so this is the Fort Negley Descendants Project. It started when um, Fort Negley was sold for condos, right? Part of Fort Negley Park, sold for condos in 2016. Um, and I went to one of the meetings to speak up about it. And I had one of those moments, um, you know, where the soul leaves the body and you just say how you really feel. Um, <laughs> yeah, but like no one came to take the microphone away, so I think I was okay, but uh, I, was real, I was really heated up. And after the meeting, I, I was approached by some people who'd been working on trying to save the fort, some descendants, some other activists, 
and they were like, hey, we could, we could use you. We could use your anger. Um, well, not just anger, like I have skills, but mainly the anger. Um, and so we started the Fort Negley Descendants Project, and we collected the stories of all the people who already know that they have a connection to the space. Um, and, and we filmed them, and we collected all the documents from the archives that we could find, all the pamphlets that they saved. And I was just blown away by how amazing Black Nashville's community is at saving all those things, right? Every time someone passes away, you save that funeral bill. Every time someone graduates, you save, you save their report cards, right? Um, that's amazing. There were so many of these documents that we were able to use to like reconstruct those family histories. It was really breathtaking. It was such a privilege to be able to see that kind of unfolding. Um, and then we have the Builders and Defenders database. I'm so excited for this because we literally just finished last week. Um, and like, you know, nothing's ever finished. I'll be doing more work on it, I'm sure. But uh, we've collected everybody. So we found everybody who built and everybody who defended. And we've put, we've taken all the documents where their names were and tried to collect as much personal information about them as possible. And then using the spatial historian, basically like connect them all so that if you find one person, you find all their people. <laughs> Right, and uh, we worked with the Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society. The Nashville president, Tania Kuntz, she's also a database expert, which is really wonderful. So we had her help and guidance, as well as a board of descendants to give us input as to like how, how to put it together. So I really think of this as like a collective Nashville community co-creation. Um, and I just really am blown away again by how generous Nashville has been in terms of sharing time, experience, information, um, and working with me to help get this database running. So um, I hope that this database will help people find family members who they've been struggling to find. And then last but certainly not least, we have an archeological project happening at Bass Street. So I'm working with Middle Tennessee State University archeologists Andrew Wyatt and Claylee Cottle Peacock. No, go back. Um, <laughs> Sorry, uh, we had a community day there, that's what you're seeing pictures of, uh, where we shared some of the artifacts that were taken from the exploration. And I cannot emphasize how exciting this is because, um, so African American sites that are from the Reconstruction era, that are like the sites of veterans who fought in the Civil War are almost unheard of. These are the first places that communities build on top of. Cities usually are like the first to like get rid of those reminders, right? And so to have this at Fort Negley Park, is absolutely stunning, and the archaeologists have been excavating the Bass Street Church remains. This church still exists. It's over on Brick Church Pike. You can go, um, which is uh, amazing. And some of the people who are deacons at that church are descendants of the space, and they were children when they attended the original Bass Street Baptist Church at Fort Negley Park. Um, so this is just my way of saying there's lots of exciting stuff to come. I really love what I do here. Um, I'm really so honored to be able to work with descendants and everybody who's got information to share. I would love if anyone else had anything, and I'm going to head out now because y'all want to hear from Pearl people. Thank you. <laughs> Powerful stories. There's some themes there, aren't there? Themes about uh, <clears throat> urban renewal and lo loss of history, but but the reclamation, the reclaiming of history uh, that is taking place here, and and we really appreciate the, the work of Linda and Angela in kind of maintaining the history, but also reclaiming it and, and finding new history uh, that helps us understand the story of not just North Nashville, but South Nashville, South Black Nashville. And we'll actually spend next year, one of our panel discussions, we'll then delve deeper into Black South Nashville. Now we'll delve into the Pearl High School story. Note Pearl had a seminal role in the growth of the Black Nashville community. Though Meg's may have been our first school, Pearl's unique place as the high school for Black Nashvillians at the beginning of the 20th century and the market left in the legacies of its graduates, teachers, and principals are inestimable. We felt that Pearl's story is one that needs to be shared and discussed and saved as we're doing tonight. We're gonna to begin with having Mildred Sample Smith, Poor High Class of 1964, former executive principal at MLK Junior Magnet High School for Science and Engineering, who will discuss the history of the physical plants themselves. I don't know if you knew this, but there were multiple Pearl High Schools. All right, Mildred, thank you. I want to say initially that being a part of this project has been tremendously rewarding for me and also instilled a period of melancholy also. 
I want to share with you that my father came from Greenback, Tennessee, with a burning aspiration for a high school education. And with a heavy East Tennessee brogue, he told us very often of the challenges that he faced as a young black boy alone in the city, working and taking care of himself while he was trying to get an education. Now, I will say also that my dad was given to hyperbole. <laughs> but through the stories, we understood his message, and it was simply this, that education was a prize, and it required sacrifice and perseverance to achieve it. And I thank him for that, and I've been lo in love with Pearl High from that day to this. So I'm pleased to share with you a brief overview of the Pearl High story and the schools. Okay, slide one. <clears throat> this building was the first Pearl High School. It opened in 1883 and was located on South Summer Street which is now Fifth Avenue and Mumbrium. It was named Joshua F. Pearl, the first superintendent of public schools, and of course he was a white man. The white staff that initially taught grades nine and 10 at the Meg's site that was originally mentioned were replaced by black administrator D.N. Crossweight and a cohort of college trained teachers, all black, several of whom held advanced degrees. And this, I think, was a tradition of high excellence that permeated the Pearl High tradition for the years that followed. And as an emerging institution, the school became the center for annual professional meetings attended by black educators locally and across the Middle Tennessee area. Pearl faculty also led many of the sessions, sharing their special projects and current studies. In 19, I'm sorry, in 18, 98. Seven students made history by graduating as the first Pearl High class. Side two. This building was Pearl's second location. Overcrowding conditions at the original site dictated the need for a larger building. And in 1917, Pearl moved to this building, a newly constructed three-story facility located at 16th Avenue North and Grant, which is now Ireland Street. The 12th grade was added at this site. And from 1916 through 1937, additional courses were added which were designed to meet the needs of the growing student population. Slide three. Now this building was the third and final site for the school. By 1936, overcrowding again necessitated a larger facility. And this building became the crowning glory of the black community. Located at 17th Avenue North and Joe Johnston Avenue, Pearl was now firmly planted in the heart of the black community near the business sector and three HBCUs, Fisk, Meharry Medical College, and a &I, which is now Tennessee State University. 
The building was designed by McKissick and McKissick, a local firm, and also the first black architectural firm in the nation. Many observers considered the building to be the most modern, the best constructed, and the most well-equipped building for black students in the city and across Tennessee. Unique aesthetic features included the geometric shapes that graced the front windows and the terrazzo tile floor at the entry for you. An informal partnership resulted with Fisk University and it proved to be of a twofold reward. The professors there worked with Pearl High students on research projects and the teachers, many of them who were Fisk alumni, infused lessons with intellectually stimulating topics, adding depth to classroom learning. In 1927, Charles S. Johnson, a nationally renowned black psychologist, came to Fisk as the director of the social research department. And during his tenure, the department published 23 books and also established the People's College, a settlement house that provided numerous training courses for the black community. Under Johnson's direction also, candidates for the master's degree studied the social characteristics of different groups of Pearl students, such as intelligence, leader and non-leader traits, and career choices of the graduates. Now, whether it was due to the ills of segregation or the impact of the Depression, or both, Pearl endured with marginal resources. Secondhand equipment, limited classroom supplies, mutilated textbooks, and meager funds for extracurricular activities. But through it all, the faculty continued to set high expectations for the students and for themselves. Marcus Gunner, a Tuskegee-trained music teacher, further developed Chick Chavis's music program until it was second to none. The marching band was widely known for the rapid cadence and vigorous high-stepping style. The orchestra band even recorded albums with century records. And one of the most prominent musicians to graduate from Pearl was Marion Moore, an opera star in the 1960s. Other prominent musicians included Milton Turner, who was a jazz drummer who also played with Ray Charles, Joe Davis, a trumpeter, who played with James Brown, and crooning Charles Dungy, who played with the Duke Ellington band. From 1936 through 1945, the curriculum broadened to include practical arts. The vocational education strand was exclusive to Pearl High School. Here, virtual classrooms provided training in bricklaying, carpentry, electronics, cosmetology, auto mechanics, and tailoring, among a few. These courses These courses prepared students to directly enter the labor market as skilled craftsmen. 
Slide four, please. This is a picture of Cone High, a predominantly white school located in West Nashville. It played an impactful role in foiling the Pearl High School dynasty. In 1983, the desegregation plan merged Pearl and Cone, with the ninth grade and the 10th grades housed at Pearl High School and the 11th and 12th grades housed at Cone. And there was shuttle service between the two sites. Mm. <laughs> Side, slide five, please. <laughs> this facility, named Pearl Cone Comprehensive High School, replaced the shared campus and officially opened in the fall of 1986. Next slide. Now, in the desegregation plan also, the Pearl High School was renamed Martin Luther King Jr. Academic High School for Health Sciences and Engineering. And who would argue with that name? <laughs> However, unrelenting alumni and friends endeavored for almost two decades to reinstate the Pearl High identity to this hallowed site. And in 2001, the school was officially named Martin Luther King Jr. Academic High School for Health Sciences and Engineering at historic Pearl High School. <laughs> Pearl alumni and friends continue to be the torch holders of an incredible legacy. We keep the traditions alive through all classes reunions, which are held every two years and the Pearl High School Heritage Classes Foundation, a 501c3 fundraising organization that awards scholarships yearly to qualifying students who are descendants of Pearl High alumni. A word about, <laughs> a word about the Pearl High archives. The archives houses an expansive and well-preserved physical history of our school during desegregation. I was pleased to meet Mr. Andrew Marinus this evening, who is also a New York Times best-selling author and director of special projects at Vanderbilt, but he wrote a very insightful article about Pearl's archives. And in that article, he mentioned two historians who were familiar with the collection. Graham Perry, curator of social history at the Tennessee State Museum and a specialist in African-American history, indicated that the Pearl collection of artifacts was on a different level from others that he had seen. Likewise, Ken Goins, a former chair of African-American and American Studies Department at Ohio State, said the archives and the size and the scope of pearls was not just a Nashville treasure, but it had significance 
on a national level. So as a window to the glorious past of this wonderful school, the archives is critical and important to the Pearl High legacy, and I personally invite you to donate to its support. Thank you. Thank you, Mildred. That's spectacular. Now, Melvin Black, Pearl High class of 1955 and a Pearl High School archivist, will share some of Pearl's luminaries with us. Though, let's recognize that no single session we would have here for an hour or two would do justice to the hundreds of Pearl High graduates who've contributed to this city, this region, and the world as physicians, lawyers, teachers, administrators, judges, presidents of colleges. But we'll, we'll take a sample for the, uh, a sample tonight, and Melvin will offer us some of those luminaries. Melvin, please join us here on the stage. Thank you. As Melvin comes up, I'd like, if, raise the lights in the audience, please, if you could. I'd like Henry Irvin to please stand. Uh, you can tell Henry, because he has the brightest red tie you'll ever see in the whole building uh, for Pearl. Henry is uh, the Pearl High School class of 1962 and has served as a high school class reunion curator. And a lot of the stuff you've seen us portray on the graduation photos and the like of the work of Henry and Melvin in preserving this. It would not be preserved if it wasn't the work for these guys and, and the archivists. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Okay. Lights down, please. Thank you, Dr. Churchwell. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My task tonight is to share some highlights of several distinguished Pearl High alumni. Now, we should know that there are so many of those highlights that we cannot include all of them this night. So let's get started. First one. Pearl High School principals from 1989, 8, 19, 1895 to 1983, there were nine outstanding principals who led the faculty and student body at Pearl High School. The faculty encouraged students to articulate educational philosophies, to grow through in instructional practice, and to direct the school and community toward responsible improvement. Those leaders include Franklin G. Smith, George Washington, Richard Harris, Braxton Merrill, John A. Galloway, John C. Hull, Leslie Cons, Samuel L. Spence, and Paul Mays. I'm reminded Mr. Hull shared with us what a teacher is. He said a teacher is an artist, a friend, a citizen, an interpreter, a builder, a cultural bearer, a planner, a pioneer, a reformer, and a believer. Next slide. Jordan Douglas Chavis, a 1927 graduate. Better known as Chick Chavis, he graduated salutatory in 1927 from Pearl High School. He earned a Master's of Art degrees in music from Fisk University. The band and instrumental music program at every black public high school in Nashville and Davidson County was organized and started by J.D. Chavis or one of the instructional music students. He personally organized the bands beginning at Washington Union High School, Pearl High School, Pearl Elementary, Fort Greene, and Elliott Elementary School. It all began in 1937 when Professor B.R. Merle, principal at Washington Junior High School, an author and composer of the Pearl High alma mater, scheduled a meet a period for J.D. to organize a class in instrumental music. This was the beginning of the marching bands in National City Schools. In 1946, 
Chick became the band director at Tennessee a and College. Next one, next slide. Vivian Thomas, a 29 graduate. Vivian Thomas, a janitor to a pioneer in heart surgery. Vivian was born in New Iberia, Louisiana on August 29, 1910. His family moved to Nashville where he graduated from Pearl High School in 1929. From 1930 to 1940, he worked as a laboratory assistant with Dr. Alfred Blaylock at Vanderbilt. In 1941, Dr. Blaylock, before moving to John Hopkins, asked Vivian to join his surgical team where he helped develop the procedure used and Blue Baby operation. Vivian Thomas, a black surgical technician with only a high school education, designed and tested anamosis subclarient artery to the pulmonary artery, resulting in the landmark Blue Baby Operation 1944. Yeah, I got that, I got it, I got it, I got it. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. He helped train many surgeons at John Hopkins in the delicate techniques necessary for heart and lung operation. His achievement stands a testament to the power of research to improve the health of generations to come. Next slide. Dr. T.B. Boyd, Jr., a 38 grad, in May of 1959, and after the passing of Dr. Henry Allen Boyd, Dr. T.B. Boyd, Jr. assumed leadership of the National Baptist Publishing Board, the Baptist Congress, and Citizen Saving and Trust Bank. The bank was founded in 1904 as a one-cent saving and trust bank by Henry Allen Boyd, Preston Taylor, and J.C. Napier. Citizen Saving and Trust Bank remains the oldest operating African-American financial institution in the United States. Dr. Boyd served in the U.S. Army during World War II. He also, he also served as pastor of Greater Salem Baptist Church in Louisville, Kentucky. Dr. Boyd was a supporter of the Civil Rights Movement. He invited Martin Luther King Jr. to serve as a speaker in the 1960 session of the National Baptist Congress in Chicago, Illinois. Dr. Boyd's leadership focused on product development and the planning of a new headquarters for the R.H. Board Publishing Board here in Nashville. Next slide, please. You'll get this one. <laughs> Robert Churchwell, family is here, 1940 grad. Mr. Churchwell was born on September and September 1917 in Clifton, Tennessee. He spent four years in the U.S. Army in World War II. In 1949, he graduated from Fish University with a degree in English. With no formal journalistic training, he began writing letters to the editors of the Tennessean and regular columns for the commentator, a weekly African-American newspaper. In 1950, Robert Churchwell was hired at the National Banner, becoming the first black to work full-time as a reporter at a predominant Southern newspaper. At first, <laughs> at first, employees of the banner would not let Churchwell work in the newsroom for the first five years. He wrote stories at home and walked to the paper to deliver them to the city editor. In 1965, he became the first African American member of the Middle Tennessee chapter of Sigma Delta Chi and vice president in 1969. In 1981, Mr. Churchwell retired from the banner. He received an award from the NAACP for achievement and print journalism contribution to the community. In 2002, the National Public Library honored Mr. Churchwell for his work as a reporter for the National Banner. Now listen to this. Mr. Churchwell, greatest reward in life was marrying the love of his life, 
Mary Elizabeth Buckingham, a 1949 graduate of Pearl High School. Thank you, Miss Family. Okay, next. <laughs> I had to put that in. All right, next slide. Dr. Mary Frances Berry, a 54 grad. After high, after high school, Mary Berry received a PhD in history from Howard, Howard University and a law degree from University of Michigan. She has received over 30 honorary doctoral degrees and numerous awards for public service and scholarly activity. She is one of, one of 75 women photographed for the book and national exhibition, I Dream of World, Portrait of Black Women Who Changed America. Dr. Berry was one of the founders of the Free South African Movement in the 1980s, which instigated protests at the South African Embassy in a su successful struggle for democracy in South Africa. Dr. Berry served as Assistant Secretary of Education in the U.S. Department of Health, Education, and Welfare during the administration of President Jimmy Carter. In 1993, President Bill Clinton designated her as Chairperson of the Civil Rights Commission. She resigned from that commission on December 7, 2004. Next slide, please. Kasi Gardner, Jr., a 54 grad. Is that right? A national native and an American musician who played the organ and piano. He was crowned the manipulator of the organ I See Sound. He taught himself how to play the organ by listening to Jimmy Smith records. In 1960, he left Nashville for Los Angeles, playing for the summer with a trio and jazz clubs. That exposure landed jobs for him with jazz saxophonist, saxophonist David Fathead Newman and Sonny Stilt. In 1998, he performed at the New York Texaco Jazz Festival. Cassie Gardner died in Ecuador. Next slide. Charles Dungey, Jr., 54 grad, born in Nashville. At an early age, he was stricken with polio. He was determined to push beyond his affliction. While at Washington Junior High School, he began playing music professionally. After high school, he earned a degree in music at Tennessee State University. Charles had a long career as a bassist and vocalist. He spent 17 years living in New York where he traveled and worked with artists such as Milt Jackson, Sammy Davis Jr., and the Count Basic Orchestra. When he returned to Nashville in 1990s, Charles worked as an adjunct instructor at Tennessee State University where he taught jazz ensemble. Charles died September the 22nd, 2002 at the age of 65. Next slide. James Jimmy Church, a 57 grad. Born in Nashville, he was introduced to church music around the age of five. At the age of 10, he joined a spiritual group and while at Washington Junior High School, he began singing religious music. In 1953, he joined the Howe Singers, a gospel group. He entered music professionally while in high school as a member of the R and Blue vocal group, the Five Seniors. The group successfully recorded on XL Record. In 1967, after spending time as a regular performer on a night train, and beat television shows. Jimmy formed the Jimmy Church Review, now known as the Jimmy Church Band. Next, please. Vincene Horsley, a 62 grad. In 1961, Vincene joined the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. After graduating from high, Pearl High School, he took part in a series of downtown marches designed to fight not only the outward sign of segregation at lunch counters, but also the attitude of people about race. During the sit-ins, he was kicked, spat on, and beaten too many times to remember. Horsa was arrested nine times. In those days, in those early days, his role in history is cemented as a hero of the National Civil Rights Movement. 
Mr. Horsley has shared his story and continues to share his story to thousands of young and adult groups throughout this city. Next slide. The Freedom Riders from Pearl High School, Ernest Rip Patton, Pauline Knight, Mary Jean Smith, and Etta Simpson. In 1961, a brave group of men and women set out for the Deep South to challenge the region's outdated criminal law, crim soul, crim cro, Jim Crim Law, Jim Crow Law, and non-compliance with U.S. Supreme Court 1960 decision in Barton versus Virginia that prohibited segregation and all interstate public transportation facilities. The selfless act of courage of these brave sons and daughters of America transformed the civil rights movement and helped pave the way for others to continue on the road to civil rights in America. Thank you. Oh, all right. All right. I got you. You got you. <laughs> Thank you there. Thanks, Melvin. Can we raise the lights again here? I'd like to acknowledge a couple of the family members of the alumni that were cited here uh, uh, tonight. Well, uh, Jay Chavis Stan, Jay's the son of Chick Chavis, uh, one of the cleanest men I ever met in town. Uh, <clears throat> Chick Chavis taught a lot of folks how to play instruments. He taught me how to play, play trumpet. I think he may have taught my brother how to play trombone, I might add, too. And then I'd like, uh, if Kathleen Austin Davidson and her son Austin Davidson, please stand, they are the the family representing the late Clarence C. Austin, one of the legendary Washington Junior High School principals. Um, and I'd like, uh, that, that allows me to move on to the, towards the end of the program, as we move towards the conclusion, to talk about our Pearl High School championship teams. I'd love Andrew Marinus to give us some sense of the legacy and importance of that team, and also talk about what we're doing about Washington Junior High, acknowledging the eminence of that particular basketball team, too. Andrew. Thank you, Dr. Chris. Well, you got a mic. It's an incredible honor to be on this stage uh, with these uh, Pearl High School alums and uh, many of whom I had a chance to interview for my book on Perry Wallace, uh, Strong Inside. And I remember Perry telling me that the proudest day of his life was when he walked through the doors of Pearl High School as a student for the first time, having grown up admiring the basketball players and the football players wearing their red Pearl uh, letter jackets and admiring his older sisters who had gone to Pearl High School. and in talking to Perry and in talking to uh, his classmates at Pearl, and you can feel it tonight, but I feel like the words that always um, I was left with after those conversations and thinking about Pearl was uh, pride and excellence. You know, um, and I think the men, young men who were on that 1966 uh, Pearl High School State Championship team were born into an environment of pride and excellence in a lot of ways in North Nashville, certainly academically, you think about Pearl High School and Fisk and Meharry and Tennessee State. But, you know, for the purposes of this conversation, certainly athletically also, when you think about over at TSU, Coach Ed Temple and Wilma Rudolph and Wyoming Atias and May Fags and Lucinda Williams, the best track team in the world was just a few blocks away from them. Um, you think about the football team at Tennessee State, which I think won seven black uh, national championships from the late 40s to about 1970, Coach Merritt and other coaches there. Uh, the basketball team at TSU under John McClendon won three straight NAIA national championships. Uh, in terms of basketball, really North Nashville was the center of black basketball in the country. Um, when you think about the success of the TSU teams and also the black high school national championship, uh, high school national championship that was played either at sites at Pearl or at, at TSU. I think Pearl High School won four of those national championships. In addition to having won 12 state championships by the time these guys got to Pearl High School. While they're at Pearl, they win the state championship. And in these days, there were separate tournaments for black schools and white schools. In 1964, they won the black uh, state championship. 1965, they win the Black State Championship and also play in the probably the most significant high school game in Nashville's history, 
when they played against Father Ryan at Municipal Auditorium in what was considered the first game of a black school against a predominantly white school, not just in Nashville, but in the South. Of course, Father Ryan's best player was black. It was Willie Brown, um, who was uh, on the Father Ryan team. Well, I'll tell you, that guy, that guy didn't miss a shot that night, I think, uh, Walt and uh, Joe and Tony. <laughs> <laughs> and then in 1966, um, the most significant year in uh, Southern high school basketball history, when the TWSAA and the Black Association merge. And these guys know that when they play in the state tournament, it'll be the first time that black schools and white schools have played in the state tournament together. And they go undefeated that season and win the state championship on March 19th, 1966 at Memorial Gym on the campus at Vanderbilt. And that was a really significant day in American sports history. Not only was this historic game played at the high school level in Nashville, it was the very same day that the famous Kentucky versus Texas Western uh, national championship game was played in college basketball. The all-white Kentucky team against an all-black starting five from, from Texas Western, which included a player named David Latin, who had started his career at TSU before he transferred to Texas Western. And he actually taught Perry Wallace how to dunk. So uh, there's that connection. He didn't need there. much coaching, I don't think, on that one. <laughs> That's right. Um, you know, Pearl High School was uh, highly regarded around the country by coaches at HBCUs and also beginning in the early 60s by uh, predominantly white schools, too. So, you know, Ronnie Lawson recruited to UCLA, a great John Wooden teams. Um, Vic Rouse and Les Hunter played on the famous uh, Loyola of Chicago national championship team in 1963. And then uh, I think almost every member of your team went on to college, many to play college basketball, including Perry Wallace, who becomes the first black player in the history of the SEC. And so I think it's uh, important to recognize the history that these men made in the 1960s, but also to recognize that their stories don't end in the 60s. You know, they went on to become successful coaches and educators and, and business people. Perry becomes a professor of law at American University. And their stories don't end back then either. You know, there's streets named after these men. There's historical markers that recognize them. And as you mentioned, on September 7th, there will be a play premiering at Nashville Children's Theater, thanks to Chancellor Deermeyer and a grant from uh, Vanderbilt in honor of the sesquicentennial of the university on the life of Perry Wallace. And um, students from Metro Nashville Public Schools will be attending the play on Tuesdays through Fridays. Again, thanks to the grant. And then there will be public performances on weekends open to the public. And also thanks to the grant, if you here are a member of the Pearl High School, if you're a Pearl alum, if you're a Vanderbilt alum, if you're a staff member, basically anybody in this room can attend uh, three performances of that play at half price. And those would be on September 9th, 23rd, and 24th. There's information about that on the Pearl High School alum Facebook page. And I think there are some flyers here that we have uh, about that play as well. But um, I think these men were born into an environment of pride and excellence, and that's the legacy that they left as well. How about the Washington Junior historical plaque? Thank you. I'm sorry. That's spectacular. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you so much. Sure. Can, can you share so, a little bit about that? That's, yeah, another project. The school for this, for this phenomenal Absolutely. Program. So that's many of you know team. Candace Lee, the athletic director at Vanderbilt, has become good friends uh, with these men, and they come to a lot of Vanderbilt basketball games. And one of the uh, uh, things that came up was the, the, what could be the lost history of Washington Junior High School and not wanting that to happen. And so Candace has funded um, a historical marker that will uh, appear at the old Washington Junior High School uh, site recognizing the history of that school. I just got to, um, yes. Yes, by the Metro Historical Commission. Oh, okay, and, right. Thank you to Linda Wynn for her help with that. <laughs> yes. Boy, that's spectacular. Thank you, Andrew. It's really important to note, I think Andrew did it for me, that uh, these men had, were spotlighting their back basketball prowess, but they went on, finished high school, finished college, great careers, high school principal, high school athletic coaches, high school athletic directors, honored veterans in the Vietnam War, and leaders in their communities. And so they are very humble. Uh, men and proud men, and we're so thankful that they're here. I'm assuming Ted and Melvin wanted y'all to answer the last two questions I've got, guys. So I'm gonna I'm gonna throw that out, at, and you all just grab the mic. Uh, the two questions out there was it, what was unique about playing basketball at Pearl? What was unique about that? And then tell us a little bit about Coach Ridley. 
How tough was he? You got the mic. You talking to me? <laughs> what was unique about uh, Coach Ridley was he was a disciplinarian. Uh, he was a pressure ball coach. Put the mic up. To, to put the mic up. Do I have to repeat what I said before? Girl, I've been sitting up here a long time. Y'all had to, to bear with me. Coach Ridley was a, a phenomenal coach simply because he liked transitional basketball. We played at Washington Junior High before we got to Pearl, and we always fast break. Right, Ricky? We always fast break. But when we got to Pearl, Ridley personified the fast break. Plus, after that, he put the break into pressure. Once we scored and once we finished on the basket, we pressed. We had teams giving up the ball before uh, uh, they get to half court. Sometimes we didn't even have to come down court <laughs> because of the pressure. He, he, was a, he was a tactician when it came to that. Now, he, he didn't do a whole lot of this, that, and the other, and the cow, and all that. He, he, he instilled in us no nonsense, hold your head up, you be proud, because he dressed us. We were the first one to come in candy stripes. <laughs> huh? When we went, when we left the Pearl High Gym, we had a red blazer with a big tiger right here. And we had a red bag with Pearl High on it. We, had, we was like a college team when we traveled. So his, his, his greatness for his coaching, I had the opportunity to to play up under him for three years. Perry Wallace and myself played in three consecutive basketball championships. That's unheard of. You, you, you don't do that. But uh, by his tutelage. And I want to say this, and I don't want to take too much time. There's two other things I want to bring out before I let this mic go. <laughs> On the night of, of 1966, March 19th, I was getting coming out of the Pearl High Gym, and I stopped on the stoop. I was getting ready to load in the cars. And across the street come Gordon Banks. And he said, come here, Fisher. And I said, okay. He said, you know what you finna go out there and do? I said, yeah, we'll go out there and play for a championship. He said, no, you ain't going out there just to play for a championship. You going out there to represent this school, this community, your family, and every black face in the state of Tennessee. <laughs> didn't, didn't realize what he was saying at that time. <laughs> Did not realize what he was saying at that time. But we went out there. And we, we, we accomplished some things that uh, a lot of folks didn't think we would be able to accomplish. You know, we dunked, we, we've been a rim. We thought we, I thought we were going to get put out of the gym. But uh, <laughs> all he just said, uh, you know, uh, take a while for us to replace the rim. And uh, the other two things I just, it just, it just skipped my mind, because you got to understand, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm 76 years old. I, That's great. I, I really can't remember what happened yesterday. There you go. <laughs> Thank you very much. Let's pass the mic. You got some comments about <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Comments about the uniqueness of Pearl, the uniqueness of, of Coach Ridley. Any comments, uh, Tony? Um, from what Slim said about Coach Ridley, it was all true. Uh, we had probably 10 of the 15 best high school basketball players in, in, in Tennessee. That includes our team, 10, plus maybe one or two from other schools. Now, when we go to other gyms, really would just let us do what we, what we need to do. We had a pregame show, and that was a dunking. And after we could see the other team standing half court watching the pregame show. <laughs> after, the, after, the, after the pregame show was over, half the, half the auditorium left. The team was beat already. So, I mean, it was, it was unique. It was, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was unique being in that kind of situation uh, where you didn't have to play your best all the time. But, uh, but really was the spearhead of everything that we did. Yeah. Thank you.
First of all, I'd like to say a couple things that Walter Fisher, Jimmy Douglas, Theodore McLean, and myself, we all played together at Washington Junior High School for three years before we went to Pearl. So there was a history there with the four of us before we got to Pearl. We met Perry, Fisher and I, we met Perry in the 10th grade at Washington Junior High School. Walter said the two of them paid on the championship team for three years. I could have played three years, but my reason I didn't play for three years was because I sat on the bench for three years at Washington, <laughs> and I told Coach Black, I said, I want to play, so they moved me down to the JV team. <laughs> so I missed out on one year. But Coach Ridley was a visionary person. He coached around his personnel. He believed in discipline. He believed in scholarship because he checked our grades every grading period. If you didn't have the grades, you wouldn't play. He believed in education. He wanted each and every one of us to be successful, not only in basketball, but after we left Pearl High School. He stayed in touch with us afterwards. I know he stayed in touch with me, even though I lived in Murfreesboro. He didn't like you, Joe. I, <laughs> he did. Most people don't like me. <laughs> but my point is, we stayed in contact with one another. And we learned a lot, not only from Coach Ridley, but the faculty and administration at Pearl High School wasn't second best to any staff and school in the state of Tennessee. What, what I enjoyed about Pearl High School, there were many classes offered to all of us. You go into Pearl High School as a teenager but you left a grown-up because you knew where you were going when you left school. When you graduated from Pearl, you know what you were headed for in the future. Pearl High School not only taught you to think, they didn't tell you what to think. They appreciated what you thought about thinking. And then they explored on those possibilities of the things that you were thinking about. That's what you learned at Pearl High School and learned from those individuals who conducted those classes over there. Mr. Hull was ahead of his time. We had, it was mentioned earlier about vocational classes. Everyone wasn't geared for the college life, but they were prepared for everyday life and skills that were presented to them at that particular time in life. And we all have taken advantage of those situations. And I can say one thing as I close. My relationship with my teammates, they're not my former teammates, they're my brothers. Fish, as I said, and Douglas and McLean, we've been together for over 60 years. And there hasn't been a crossword between any of us for those 60 years. We communicate today with one another. We all stay in touch with one another. That's what Pearl High has done for us. It has built on some young, black, poor, boys in North Nashville 
who have come on to be leaders, not only in our communities, but communities throughout this United States. And we are all over the United States. And I appreciate Pearl High School for that leadership and guidance. Well, thank you. Let me, let me mention this. Let me mention this before we pass the mic on. We got five of the starting five of that championship team. They are all in the Hall of Fame. Where do they do that at? There's no other school, no other college, no other high school, no other pro team has got that starting five in the Hall of Fame. 1966 state championship basketball team, Pierre Wallace, James Douglas, Ted McLean, Joe Herbert, and myself. We're all in the Hall of Fame. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Thanks, guys. Thank you all so much for sharing. I'd like, uh, this is really, this is very rich, and thank, uh, thank you all for sharing, sharing with us tonight. Two kind of closing comments. First off, uh, Carolyn Ridley, uh, the late uh, Cornelius Ridley's wife, wanted to be here, but she came up with a medical illness, but she wants to send along her love and support for you guys, okay? I wanted you all to know that. Uh, and number two, one comment my father made uh, uh, that rings, uh, that has resonance here is he said, you know, going to Pearl in the 1930s and the times that you guys are describing was like going to a junior college because those, those teachers had no other choice but to be teachers. They didn't have the opportunities that, that I had or my brothers have to go to, to college, you know, to go to medical school and all these different schools or law school or to uh, become presidents or, or the like of, of the United States like Obama. So, so they put their heart and soul into their education and the teaching of you guys, not just, as you pointed out there, not just to deliver an education about books, but an education about life. Yeah, so thank you all. That, I need to get that in. Well, we're at the end of the event. I wanna thank everybody for coming. Uh, I hope you enjoyed yourselves and you learned something. And I want you to look forward to coming uh, to our next session on September 13th on the Latinx and Hispanic community. I wanna thank everyone here uh, I want to thank a couple of people before we close. I want to thank uh, Nathan Green, my buddy who's vice chancellor, and Midori Lockett, his, uh, his uh, person who takes care of community government relations, who helped us put this on, helped us get the food. Midori, raise your hand. Are you still here? She may have had to leave. That's great. I really appreciate her. I want to thank the, the public library staff, Rebecca Price and her team. I want to thank the Vanderbilt University library team that helped us with our slides, Seth Robertson and Carla Beals, as well as uh, John Shaw, the, the director of the library. From my office, Marla Robertson, and then, of course, always close with my wife of 41 years who kicked me out of bed to be here. <laughs> so I'm very, very thankful that she was here. So uh, I'd like to, but as, before we leave, I want to give one round of applause. Before, before we leave, I'd like everybody to stand. We're, you don't know this. We're going to sing the Pearl High alma mater. <laughs> and we have uh, a, 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 a JPEG, a, a, a tape version, I'm sorry, of Paul, the great Nashville jazz singer Paula Chavis, who was a Pearl graduate singing this alma mater. So if you guys could flip to that for me. You got it? And the words are on the screen. Go. Here it comes. You know, well, the words will be there. You ready? Come on. <laughs>